every day I pick up trash outside my house and I don't think that there's anywhere else that I've lived in the world that I've had trash blowing in my front yard. From what I've read, 62% of the British population litters and that is a travesty. Hey there, I'm Kristen. I am from the US, but I've been in the UK for the past couple of months. There are things I love and there are things that I don't like so much. But in this video, I'm gonna share with you some of the things that I find a bit strange about British culture and let me know if you agree. I'm a big breakfast person. I don't know about you, but breakfast is one of my favorite meals of the day. And to this day, I find it very difficult to wrap my head around the idea of the full English breakfast. Now this can usually consist of eggs, toast, beans, a type of bacon that we're not familiar with in the US, and also some types of sausage or like a blood sausage type of thing, which might be called a pudding. But I, in the US, we do breakfast, right? Like we have huge breakfasts, we have stacks of pancakes, we have bacon and eggs, all of that stuff. But for some reason, I just can't get on board with the full English breakfast. The first time I ever tried it was in Malta in 2013. There's a lot of British restaurants and pubs in Malta. There's a big connection there between the UK and Malta uh, for reasons that could be in another video. But uh, that's where I tried the full English, as you will hear it called, not just full English breakfast, the full English, that's what it is. And you know, I just didn't love it. And I'm sorry to say <laughs> to the Brits, I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, I like a different type of toast. I like a different type of bacon. I don't like beans. I don't like blood sausage or puddings or any of that sort of stuff. And I, I'm the kind of person that just wants like an avocado toast and a side of fruit or maybe uh, avocado toast with some scrambled eggs or some eggs with some greens. Like I'm a simple when I come to my breakfast. And for me, I just feel like the full English is just, it's a lot. Another thing about the food that I find strange, and you'll see this in other countries throughout Europe as well, is that they don't cut your pizza for you. They will bring you the full pizza in one circle and they'll just bring you a butter knife and be like, good luck. And it just doesn't work, people. I'm always asking them for a sharper knife, maybe a pizza cutter. Like there's a reason that a pizza cutter was included. And you know, I see everyone else cutting their pizza with the fork and knife. And if they just cut it for you in the kitchen, you could just pick it up and eat it like a slice of pizza. And so I just don't get this. And maybe somebody can explain why you do it this way here. Is it because people like to eat their pizza in different ways? Is it because it takes too long for the kitchen to cut the pizza for you? I don't know. But either way, they should bring a pizza cutter, you know, deliver that to the table with your food. And, you know, I mostly see people trying to cut their pizza into slices and not doing a very good job of it. So I don't really get this about British and European culture in general. Something that scared me at first was actually that the mail people will deliver the mail through a slot in your door. And if they would just put it in the slot, that would be fine. But often they like bang on the door. And this happens with uh, Amazon packages and any sorts of deliveries. And also sometimes with just the mail, it's like they will bang on the door really loud and then put something through the slot or it's like, it's a metal slot, so it like clangs open and it's, it's completely silent in my house and then all of a sudden it's like, bam, bam, like this loud noise at the front door and that's what it is. And I'm not really sure why in the US we have mailboxes and in the UK we have mail slots. You know, it is more convenient for the mail to just be dropped and plopped right into your front door. Yeah, and I have also noticed that the, the male men and women here, they deliver mail together. So in the US, you'll typically see people walking around, you'll see them on bikes, or you'll see, see them in the little tiny white USPS, uh, little mail cars, and they're always by themselves. And you know, it could be kind of lonely, but here they're in the red Royal Mail van instead of a car, and there's usually two people going together. And I have to say, my mailman, they always look very happy. In the US, there's this stereotype about like crazy male people or that they're 
depressed or something. The stereotype comes from the term going postal, which was coined after multiple mass shootings at USPS facilities in the United States between 1970 up until present day. And first of all, workplace mass shootings are a thing of the United States anyway, but according to Reddit, postal workers in the U.S. are overworked, have poor work-life balance, they're stressed out, and also this contrast with the typical workplace in England, which we'll talk about in just a minute, about the benefits, the health care, and the vacation days that you get in the U.K. But here, I think because there's teamwork and they're riding around in the van together. They just seem to be bantering, you know, talking to each other. And it, it always uh, catches me off guard because I'm like, these people are probably sitting in this van together all day delivering mail and they look like they're having a blast. And so they'll like come by, they'll drop off one person and that guy will walk down the street delivering mail right up to the door. And then I guess they meet up somewhere else and then they continue, whoops, and then they continue on their route. And so that's something a bit weird and different, but I, I do like it. Something that was very weird to me at the beginning, but now I think is completely normal, is how the electricity is. So having the, the giant three-pronged plugs and the 220 volt instead of the 110 that we have in the US, also the fact that you can switch the plugs on and off to conserve electricity, just imagine how much electricity the US would save if everyone can turn their light switches on and off. I mean, it would be mind boggling and I feel like everyone should have this option. Uh, they also have a lot more outlets than you're used to in the US. Like I've noticed like in this room, I mean, I think I have like seven electrical outlets and it's a pretty small living room. So. Uh, that was weird. And then also that they don't have the plugs in the bathroom for safety reasons. Sometimes they'll have a little shaver outlet there, but um, so you don't electrocute yourself. They don't put outlets in the bathrooms. And at first I was very confused because I couldn't find, you know, where's the hair dryer in the hotel? Where do I plug in the hair dryer? And it's just not in the bathroom because that's the way that the uh, building regulations are in the building codes. Another weird thing to me that happens a lot throughout Europe, and I've talked about this in videos before, some people agree with me, some don't, is that I feel like I'm always missing an appliance. Like in this house, I have a refrigerator, I have a washing machine, and I have a dishwasher but I rarely have a garbage disposal, which is something that is pretty standard in the US. And I think that's because everyone composts here. So it's probably better for the environment to compost than use the garbage disposal. I'm not sure, but that's probably the reason why they don't have them. Very rarely do I have a dryer. Sometimes I do, but the dryers take a really, really long time to dry things. So you might as well hang them up anyway. And in this case, I seem to be the only person in the country who doesn't have a freezer. So it's a weird thing about the UK and Europe is that I feel like I never have all of the appliances that I want or need. Also, the way that the UK does climate control and heating their homes is so much different from the US. So in the US, we will have a central climate control system, like an AC unit that does heating and cooling through air vents. In the UK, many houses don't have air conditioning. Maybe they'll have these little mini split units that go on a, on a wall in a room to just cool down, or actually those can be used for heating as well. So cool down or heat up that room and they have space heaters as well but to heat the water they have what's called a boiler and i'm still not exactly sure how that works i actually had to google how to turn mine on because it's not intuitive whatsoever and this seems to heat the water as well as be the central heating for the house which is through radiators. And I think the, the way the boiler works is pretty cool because in the US we would have a hot water heater and that's not very efficient because you could have that hot water heater running all day, even if you're at work and you're not home, like maybe you only use hot water in the morning or at night or morning and night. And in the UK, it's not heating the water 24 seven. 
So in the US, if you wanna save electricity, you need to turn your hot water heater off. But in the UK, if you have the boiler on auto setting, then it only heats the water when you turn on the hot water. And so that is a weird thing about the UK, but it seems quite logical and sensible. Something I find weird about the housing here is that all of the houses seem to look the same. They all seem to be in a very similar architectural style. And you will notice this as you're flying into the UK, regardless of where you're landing throughout the country, whether you're in London or another city or the countryside. And this can happen in the US as well, especially if it's in some sort of development where there's one or two or three styles of housing to choose from. But in general, across the US and really across the world where there's not many zoning regulations or you've just got like lots of different types of people, everyone is creating houses that either reflect what they can afford to build or reflect their personality, their design aesthetic. Uh, but here I noticed that a lot of the houses are just brick houses. They look like townhomes. They all kind of look alike. And I'm not actually sure why that is, if it's because there's some regulation about that, or if maybe that's just the easiest way to build houses, or maybe all of the architects and the construction companies are just using the same plans for everything. And of course the interior of the houses might look different, but I just noticed walking down a lot of the streets that you'll just see you know, a lot of the houses, like it's hard to tell them apart. And um, whereas in the US you could see a cottage, you could see a mansion, you could see a townhome, like you could see 20 different styles of houses on one street. And it's probably also because of in the US we split up the land into lots and we have a lot of suburbs and in places where people can just do whatever they want um, on, on that piece of land. But I do find that a bit weird. So if you have any insights into that, comment below. Speaking of houses, I still don't understand the bed sizes here. So when I first got here, I had to go buy some sheets and it, I probably spent an hour measuring the beds, Googling things and trying to figure out what type of sheets to get and they still don't fit properly. So a twin bed in the US would be a single bed here, which makes more sense. Like why do we call it a twin bed? But then there's different sizes of double beds. There's a double bed, there's a small double, there's a large double. But in this house, I have what appears to be, I guess it's a double. It's smaller than a queen, bigger than a twin. So maybe like a full size bed is a double here. But then I have another bed that's smaller than a full, but it's bigger than a twin and I can never find sheets to fit it. So if you have any insights on the beds and sheet sizes, that's very key. So comment below. Something I've also noticed on the products that I buy is that they're all made in different places than I'm used to being from the US. You know, the US is a very a consumer focused economy and so we have a lot of variety but when you really look at where things are made a lot of them are from China or China or China or the US or China or sometimes Vietnam or Cambodia but you don't really see a very wide range of products from different countries unless you're going to some sort of specialty store or high-end boutique or maybe a, a outdoor farmers market or something like that but here I notice things in the grocery stores from everywhere. I notice things that are made in New Zealand. I notice things that are made in Pakistan, uh, from Iran, from Lebanon, from all sorts of countries that you don't typically see those countries labeled on the packages. And I don't know if that's because of maybe in the US we have um, like different trade agreements, uh, but it does seem like the vast majority of products now in the US and on Amazon and things come from China. And I'm sure they have that here as well, but I've just noticed goods from countries that I would just never see on, on packages. And so I think that's weird, but I think it's pretty cool because it seems like the UK is importing from all different countries around the world. Something that was weird to me at first, but I definitely wish that I had the same thing, is the type of work benefits and holidays that the Brits get. So this kind of goes into the social services type of sphere. So first of all, everyone gets 
more vacation time than we would in the US and it's federally mandated, it's not uncommon to hear people of like popping off for a vacation for two, three or four weeks. And in the US, you might hear people going away for one week. And so at first I was, um, I was shocked that so many people were just going away on holiday as they would call it and we would call it vacation and um, also the places that people go. So this is really attributed to your location and the geography of where you live. So if you're from Australia, then it's very common for you to just go to Indonesia, go to Bali, uh, go to places in the South Pacific or Southeast Asia to go on holiday. You know, you could go to Vanuatu, Fiji, New Zealand, and these are very long haul flights from the US. So from the US, you see a lot of vacation destinations that are advertised within the US, lots of places in the Caribbean, like Jamaica, Puerto Rico, where we have direct flights, lots of flights to places in Mexico. Um, but here it's really interesting to see where people are going because when Americans go to Europe, a lot of times we go to the most famous places, like we go to Rome in Italy or Venice, or we go to Paris in France, we go to London in England. Maybe we're not the most original when it comes to planning our trips. But rather than uh, US tourists that are going to Madrid and Barcelona in Spain, British tourists will go places like Malaga, they'll go to the islands of Mallorca and Menorca, they'll go to the Canary Islands, uh, they'll go to uh, sometimes places that I've never even heard of within Spain. And so they seem to either have different marketing over here or like a different just collective knowledge of different holiday destinations that you can go to that wouldn't really be high on Americans' radars. And so this has really inspired me to uh, think deeper about where I'm going to go and kind of go to some off the beaten path destinations. A lot of Brits will also go places like Bulgaria, they'll vacation on the Black Sea, they'll go throughout the country, throughout the countryside and to beach towns like Cornwall and Brighton, whereas in the US we think about you know going to California or going to Miami or going to New York or something like that. But it is great to hear about all the different places that people are traveling and places like the Lake District I had never heard about until I got here and actually some of some of you guys commented on YouTube um, places I could go in the UK and Scotland, so I really appreciate that. And yeah, just in general, going to different holiday destinations and staying there longer. Now, Brits also get to benefit from having better social services than I'm used to. Uh, like the girl who uh, owns the dry cleaner by my house, she is almost about to have her first baby. And so I was talking with her about how the healthcare system is here. And she shared with me that, well, first of all, everything is free. So if you have a baby, it's free. And I think that goes in a lot of countries that have universal healthcare, but it also means that I think she said for the first two years after you have your baby, like everything is free. And while you're pregnant, medications are free, checkups are free eye doctor, ear doctor, like anything that you need is free. And I think that's because it is a na the National Health Care Service. The government is funding it, of course, using taxpayer dollars as well. But there's this incentive from the government side to keep the mother and the baby healthy, to keep the entire population healthy because a sick population is going to take away resources from the country and from the government, whereas the incentives are a bit convoluted in the United States where actually having a sick population can create a lot of profit for pharmaceutical companies, for private hospitals and medical centers. And because we don't have that public option for healthcare, the government is not so like motivated and incentivized to keep everyone healthy or to offer people like free checkups and free medications and things like that. And so I was so shocked to hear all of that. And also it was weird that every time, like she doesn't get to pick her doctor. So she doesn't get to pick who delivers her baby. It's like every time she goes in for blood work or a checkup, it can be a different OBGYN. It's just kind of whoever's available, 
but she said she had a really good experience and that you would only have to see a specialist or the same person if you had complications during your pregnancy. So I think no matter how many years I've lived abroad, like I still can't get over how much we pay in the US for health insurance and medical care and just how that's just not a stress whatsoever in people's lives and other places because it's covered and yeah, maybe the system's not perfect. Maybe they don't get to pick their doctor or maybe they have to wait sometimes for, for different um, surgeries or medical conditions, but I, th I mean, it's free. And yeah, they're paying through their taxes, but it's just, it's sorted. And um, yeah, that's something that I, I just w wish was different about my country. And I wish it wasn't so weird to me that you can just have a baby for free and that you can just have free healthcare in your country. I wish that was normal for me. Being from the US where we have a separation of church and state and politics, we have freedom of religion, and there is a very intentional effort to you know, never discuss uh, any sort of religion in, in the public discourse. For me, then it's weird to hear people in official roles or in the government or representing the royals or on the news, like talk about God, talk about the church, the Church of England, um, even though, you know, obviously the government is different here and the history of the church and state here is much different from the US, but it still like kind of throws me off guard. Like I'll think, oh, well, at first like, oh, well, they're talking about religion on TV. Also, the way that, that you guys go through prime ministers is so strange to people from the US. I mean, you, everyone in the world sees how our political system works or doesn't work and how much buildup there is to the elections every four years. And it is just flabbergasting to me how you can just change prime ministers and like nominate new people and then a few weeks later change to another person and there doesn't have to be a national vote. I mean, that would never work in the United States. It would be complete anarchy. And so that is something so strange to me, but I, I'm glad it works for you guys. Um, and, and also that you can just have people for multiple terms or have them come back and in and out. But seeing the UK just go through prime ministers like so often over the years is, is very strange to me. The British humor is also a bit weird to me sometimes, I'll do, although I do love watching uh, British TV shows and love all of my friends here in the UK, but it does take some adjusting to um, where I have noticed that sometimes when people are uh, very polite to you or like directly friendly, then that can mean that maybe they're just acquaintances or maybe they don't like you or maybe they don't have a close relationship with you. Whereas if people are like teasing you or joking with you or if they're giving you a hard time, basically, then it means that they like you. And in the US, if people are teasing you or giving you a hard time, it, it might not mean <laughs> that they like you at all. So that's something that has um, taken a little bit of getting used to, but uh, everybody is so nice and friendly here anyway that it hasn't been too hard to adjust to. Another thing that's weird that I noticed the first time I came to London back in 2013 is how expensive the taxis and the Ubers are. In the US, especially where I've been living lately in Miami, you can get a shared Uber for like five or six dollars or a short Uber for seven or eight or ten dollars. And here it's like minimum eight to 15 pounds and easily like going to the airport, which is only maybe 15 or 20 minutes away, can cost me 30 to 35 pounds. I have found that the taxis are still more expensive than Ubers, even though a lot of times my friends say that Ubers are more. They also have a few other ride sharing apps here, but yeah, in London, I mean, you can pay 20 pounds to go like a few blocks down the road. And also the traffic is so bad there that you wouldn't want to take a car or an Uber or a taxi anyway. You would want to walk or take public transportation because it will take you twice as long or at least the same amount to drive and cost you 
10 to 20 times more as it as it would to take public transportation. But I don't know why the Ubers and taxis are so expensive here, but it's definitely a big difference and it's more expensive than other countries in Europe. It's more expensive than like peak fares in the US. It's actually very similar to the prices I was paying in Ireland, but if you know anything about that, then enlighten us in the comments below. So those are some of the things that I thought were pretty weird when I got to the UK. And if you can explain any of them or if I miss some, then let me know in the comments below. If you're a longtime subscriber here, then welcome back. Good to see you. And if you're new here, my name is Kristen. I have traveled to more than 60 countries in the last 20 years, and I created this channel to help you travel farther, better, and longer, and to help you really integrate with the cultures of the places that you're traveling. So if you like this video and you wanna see more, consider subscribing, give it a like, hit that notifications bell, and see you again very soon.